I will give a short overview on photons and the neutrons production using large scale facilities. Interaction of photons with matter and comparison with neutrons. And I'll make an overview of the photon based methods that uh, will be further on presented and discussed at uh, this uh, <coughs> uh, Hercules School. So uh, what is a synchrotron radiation? Uh, it is actually an electromagnetic <laughs> radiation emitted by uh, electrons of principle, also the charged particles that are moving with this, almost with the speed of uh, light and their path is altered by magnetic field. Altering their path, we actually make them to lose some energy and this energy is lost as emitting uh, <clears throat> synchrotron radiation. So uh, these uh, uh, type of uh, facilities can be circular synchrotrons and uh, linear accelerators that are FELs. So <clears throat> the first time that uh, this synchrotron light was observed was in 47 uh, in the United States and it was considered uh, as a nuisance, uh, something that makes the uh, accelerated uh, particles to lose their energy, and it was uh, used and started to use as a parasitic mode afterwards. And the first generation dedicated synchrotron light facility was built also in the United States in 16. It was called Pantelos. Then uh, uh, it uses only the bending magnets, and then. The second generation dedicated synchrotron light was built in the United Kingdom in Dalesbury. And from 93, we uh, started building and we showed that using insertion devices, we can have better high brilliance and more coherent light. And I'm glad to announce here that people shouldn't forget that the 93 at Electro was demonstrated the first third generation synchrotron beam and very short afterwards was at SRF. So now we have also the first low emittance diffraction limited synchrotron light at max four that uses uh, special technology and the lecture is going to build also something like that in, in the future. And what is uh, this push, uh, we get more brilliance and more coherence with this generation. But uh, the best sources that can provide you fully coherent light are free electron lasers. They're indeed very complicated, like expensive facilities, but they uh, perform like lasers, but giving up to kilo electron volts, 10, 12 kilo electron volts, pulses of light and uh, with a very high brightness that in a single shot of pulses, we can get information for our samples in some cases, not in all cases. So the neutron production, the most uh, advanced are spallation sources. Uh, they are high powered accelerator of protons that are hitting <laughs> a heavy metal target. And the fusion is uh, the capture of neutrons by fusionable nucleus, and it's an exothermal chain reaction. So we will hear more about that in the next lecture. So that's why I very briefly will show this uh, slide in order not to lose time. So the fusion is capture of a neutron by a <coughs> fusionable uh, nucleus, and uh, uh, it actually has a few neutrons per event, so it is not very intense sources, where the spallation, as I mentioned, is uh, the protons hitting a heavy metal target and they're producing much more <coughs> neutrons and they're more intense lights. So here I show that the, <coughs> the neutron energy that you can reach with the spallation source is uh, much higher and they're actually also naturally pulled sources. So they're approaching uh, uh, in some order the photons produced uh, <coughs> by synchrotrons. But in any case, compared to, compared to, uh, to uh, uh, photons and uh, neutrons as a cross-section of scattering that is very important, you can see immediately here that uh, neutrons 
are, <coughs> have a very high scattering from light elements, which is not the case of photons, uh, as you'll hear later. And this is one of the great advantages of the neutrons to look at light elements. So synchrotron light, uh, I'll talk mostly for, uh, uh, for synchrotron uh, <coughs> circular accelerators, uh, since uh, for FELs we need much more and SERI is still not using FELs too much. So uh, as I mentioned, the electron circulating uh, the ring uh, uh, emit uh, loose energy and they uh, can emit photons in very, very broad range. So what is the characteristic of this uh, emitted uh, photon light, photons? Uh, they have a very high brightness. What does it mean, high brightness, that you have a lot of photons in square uh, area for second and for uh, angle. So they're tunable. That is very, very great advantage because tunability gives us the opportunity for one of the best and more <coughs> powerful spectroscopy. So you can change the wavelength of uh, your photons and choose the right photons, for example, for other spectroscopy to have higher cross section. They're partially coherent, and especially the coherence is highly increased when we use uh, specific magnetic devices, so-called modulators, for producing and manipulating the electrons. They're polarized, so you have multiple polarization, linear and circular, and uh, it gives a great opportunity to uh, look at magnetic elements. And we have also a time structure, not the time structure of FELs, but uh, we have a possibility for nanosecond uh, resolution uh, using uh, uh, <coughs> the bunches of the electrons that are produced. So if we compare photons and also neutrons uh, with the charged particles, uh, uh, so using electron and or ion uh, emission, what do they have? They have high penetration power. And this is energy control, depends on the energy of the photons and the neutrons as well. There are a variety of scattering methods and mismaging contrast that you can uh, reduce uh, thanks to the interaction of photons and, and neutrons with the samples with the matter. There are a vari variety of spectroscopy, so you can have elemental, chemical, magnetic, uh, and all other information we are interested. And they're less sensible to sample environment in the sense that, uh, for example, short wavelengths or high energy photons and uh, neutrons, they can penetrate deeply and then don't uh, lose too much uh, energy, as is the case of uh, electrons. So here I tried to make uh, two tables in order to be easier for the uh, Students, uh, I've provided the PDF file. I did, sorry, I didn't understand how to upload uh, my uh, presentation, but I'll provide it immediately. So the, the main uh, characteristic of neutron and photon interactions with matter that they're dominated by short range forces, but they're fundamentally different. Photons interact with atomic electrons, whereas in neutrons interact with atomic nucleus. So, and uh, photons, I just say, there is a photoelectric effect that, uh, as a consequence, uh, provides a lot of uh, opportunity. So here, uh, with PLUS, you can see what are the <coughs> advantages of these sources. They're, I can say they're complementary. But uh, uh, these advantages, one of the disadvantages of uh, photons is they're very, very bright and very intense is so-called radiation damage because you ionize the matter by ejecting electrons. And the disadvantages of neutrons that compared with photons, they have lower brightness and they have limited uh, special and time resolution. <clears throat> so, one of the fundamental issues in interaction of neutrons and uh, photons with matter 
is uh, whether as a result of this interaction of scattering of photons and neutrons with matter, they lose or they lose energy. So if they don't lose energy, we have elastic scattering, which means that we redirect the photons and uh, neutrons. We can get out of that uh, structural information if we have ordered just crystal graphic structures. We can see the lattice, we can see density and all the variation. In elastic scattering is when, as a result of this interaction, photons and neutrons lose energy. And uh, actually on the basis of this loss of energy, using uh, different detection modes, we get uh, a lot of information for uh, any kind of energy distribution and for chemical state and so on. So we have a lot of spectroscopies that are based uh, on the consequences of inelastic scattering. So very shortly, the chief neutron matter interaction, uh, their scattering, and uh, capture. So elastic, scat elastic scattering uh, is important for a few mega neutrons, <laughs> sorry. Uh, they collide with atomic nucleus. Uh, uh, they're <clears throat> deflected uh, with small loss of energy uh, and uh, <clears throat> energy giving, given is given to the recoiling nucleus. So, uh, as a result, uh, you can get uh, a lot of uh, structural information from this uh, inelastic, scat in elastic scattering. So inelastic scattering is uh, when uh, the neutron momentarily captured by nucleus uh, is uh, re-emitted with less energy and the nucleus left in excited state relaxes by emitting uh, gamma rays or some charge particles. So neutron capture uh, is when the neutron is captured by the nucleus of the material. And in this case, only gamma rays uh, are uh, <coughs> emitted and they provide uh, again information for the sample and the investigation. So here I just, uh, as I mentioned before, I just uh, want uh, shortly to illustrate you that the neutron scattering power is random. It is not like with the photons that depends on the atomic number of the material under interaction and uh, their positive and uh, repulsive and negative attraction potentials uh, for the neutrons. You can see this uh, scattering. And one thing you can see is, uh, uh, again, that the light elements uh, are quite uh, well distinguished. Also, isotopes we can see very well with uh, neutrons. And it is very important for organic matter where, the, where hydrogen that is very well distinct with uh, neutrons can be uh, <coughs> Uh, replaced in some uh, uh, bonds uh, with deuterium. So the neutron-based methods are very similar to the one uh, that uh, we have with uh, photons, with uh, X-rays as well, their diffraction. Uh, <clears throat> small angle neutron scattering. So with diffraction, we can see again the structure, the lattice of element. With small angle <clears throat> neutron scattering, we can uh, see the cons different constituents uh, of uh, the sample with the small sizes. Refle <coughs> reflectometry is uh, something that uh, allows us to see thin films and surfaces, uh, imaging and spectroscopy that we can probe atomic molecular motions, magnetic, because uh, they have also magnetic uh, <coughs> sensitivity. And they're complementary to the relevant uh, photon-based uh, method. So let's we go to photons or X. I like to use photons because, as I mentioned, the synchrotron light starts from terahertz and goes uh, further on to very hard X-rays. For example, infrared uh, uh, <coughs> beam lines 
are very common at uh, our facilities and probably some of you have used our uh, infrared beam line uh, at the lecture. And just uh, in order to indicate to the students, if you want uh, to study organic matter and living objects, use infrared because uh, uh, X-rays are killing the organic matter very easily. That is so-called radiation damage. So <clears throat> when uh, uh, X-rays uh, or photons are hitting the sample, there are many events that uh, occur, as I mentioned, elastic, inelastic scattering, uh, there is photo emission, and as a result of the excitation processes in the atoms, uh, after the emission of electrons, we have Auger electrons and fluorescence. And when uh, the beam passes uh, through the sample, there is beam attenuation and uh, absorption and scattering again. So let me see now. Elastic scattering. So with elastic scattering, uh, only electron oscillations. Occur. So there is uh, no ejection of uh, electrons, so there is uh, no loss of the energy of the heating rays, but they're re redirecting. And uh, thanks to, to this uh, event, measuring the intensity of redirected uh, X-rays, depending on the angle, incident or acceptance angle, we can have uh, X-ray diffraction and we have, can have a short range uh, information uh, about uh, the structure of our sample. We have powder diffraction sucks. You can hear uh, small angle uh, uh, scattering and the relevant white angle scattering, all this uh, information of the structure of the sample is uh, ex exclusively important. <clears throat> we have also X-ray uh, reflectivity that allows us to use, uh, to look at thin films, to look at uh, the thickness of thin films, density of the thin films, and also the roughness of the sample. So in elastic scattering, in this case, there is electron excitation and the scattered X-ray lose some energy. And depending uh, whether the energy is lost due to uh, excitation of, of monos, uh, the solid state, uh, uh, balance electrons and so on and so on, we can get very important information, and this is actually type of spectroscopy. <laughs> we have the uh, elastic uh, uh, scattering spectroscopy, and the most uh, required recently is resonant uh, elastic scattering, where we can tune our photons to the resonances of elements of, uh, of importance uh, for the sample, and uh, we can see spectroscopically what uh, are the excitations and what happens. So photoelectron spectroscopy is uh, directly uh, coming uh, from the fact uh, that uh, if the photons have energy higher than the binding energy of an electron in the core of balance state, uh, or the balance uh, uh, electrons in uh, matter under interaction, so that is valid for gas, uh, liquid, and solid state. We have ejection of the electron, and the kinetic and energy of this electron is uh, actually the fingerprint of the element uh, that is uh, emitting this electron. Since uh, after this ejection, our matter is under a excited state, there is a de-excitation, and as a result of the de-excitation, we can have an ejection of the Auger electron, or we can have a fluorescence emission. Plus, I would like to point out that uh, as a result of uh, photon uh, matter interaction, you can get fragmentation, and you can have even photon uh, induced uh, desorption if you have some molecules bonded onto the surface. So, when uh, we have a sample and the uh, beam passes through our sample, I'll show you uh, a little bit uh, later also that we can have this microscopy. 
by the beam attenuation due to absorption of these photons by the constituents of the matter, we can do imaging of the density of the material, so it depends what uh, uh, is the concentration, local concentration of constituents. We can tune our photons to some absorption edge, to some uh, of our, uh, <clears throat> that is the constituent of our sample, and we can have magnetic uh, or chemical imaging. So we can see exactly where some element that is contained in some part of the sample is uh, present and how it is distributed. And since we have coherence, I don't have time to talk also too much about that. We can have a phase contrast, but I think that uh, Juliana Trump will tell you more that is encoded in the refractive index and tachography that is coherent diffraction imaging uh, method that gives you a, a lot of information, not only for uh, the, the state, but uh, really adds more to the <coughs> resolution and to seeing a very, very small <coughs> particles uh, in, in your sample. <coughs> so now I'm going on to tell you a little bit more about all these type of interactions of photons with the matter. As I mentioned before, there are many events that can happen. So the incident uh, X-ray beam can be scattered and change it, redirected without energy loss. It can be redirected with energy loss. And as a result of electron emission, we can have uh, uh, actually electron and fluorescence uh, emission that is particularly uh, <clears throat> important for getting uh, elemental and chemical information for our sample. <clears throat> so one of the important uh, characteristics of uh, photons is, it <clears throat> is the absorption coefficient. The photon matter interaction is absorption coefficient which uh, uh, depends on the wavelength or uh, on the energy of the photon and surely on our uh, on the elements that are in our sample and the scattering factor as you see both they depend on the photon energy and changing the photon energy, we can select the best conditions for studying our sample. So whether the photons will be more or less absorbed depends on the sample thickness, on the density and the composition of the sample. Surely, the, as I mentioned, uh, the heavier elements are absorbing more than light elements because they have more electrons. So the absorption coefficient that uh, I'll uh, show you is very important also for all the, the spectroscopies, depends on this absorption cross-section, which is uh, uh, characteristic for each <clears throat> element, plus it changes, it cross-section changes with the photon energy, above the number and the atomic way. So, more quantitatively, uh, when the photons <coughs> are absorbed with the thickness of the sample, the uh, number, the intensity of the photons after this absorption depends on their initial intensity and uh, on the number of absorptions or on the concentration absorption cross-section and the depth of the sample. So let's we start from the first step. The first step is photon is absorbed elastically or inelastically scattered. So all the following uh, events that are happening depends whether the photon energy is sufficient to ionize the atom. So it's sufficient to eject electrons from the atoms. In principle, 
Uh, above you, we light, uh, we know quite well, it, even UV light is sufficient to eject uh, uh, some electrons from the barium plant. So, these are the three steps that happen. If an electron from one of the atomic orbital is ejected, its kinetic energy will be dependent on the photon energy and the binding energy of the electron. Since we know the photon energy, this is the uh, work function of the spectrometer that is a fixed number for each uh, detector. So it, it, as you see, uh, this directly gives you information for the atom that is injecting, uh, that is losing the electron because the core level electrons have quite well known binding candidates. So as I mentioned, the creative role results in excited state and to restore equilibrium, we uh, have uh, uh, Auger process uh, or uh, <coughs> rest chance emitting. So the electron from another lower energy orbital fuse this core. As, as a result of the energy gain, we can eject another electron, that is the electron, or we can have fluorescence emission. Usually the uh, Auger uh, ejection is uh, more characteristic for lighter elements, whereas fluorescence emission is more characteristic for heavier elements. I have no time to go to all details, uh, but, uh, but this is the principle. So, also, these Auger electrons and fluorescence emission are uh, actually fingerprints for the atoms from where they're coming. And uh, uh, in principle, also the electrons that are ejected from deeper uh, layers of our sample, they can be scattered. And from this scattering, we can get information for another event and for another characteristic of our sample. So, following steps is the transport. And as I mentioned, they can be scattered from other atoms. They have energy losses. Uh, and uh, you can see in the solid state plasma on shake up uh, and uh, other excitations. So, reaching the detector, we need to energy filter them in order to, to get the spectrum. And uh, you see a bit of later that the spectrum is very good fingerprint of the elements that are constituents of our sample and for their chemical state or uh, magnetic state and so on. <clears throat> so this is a short uh, overview of what I told you up to now. So the photon is absorbed elastically or inelastically scattered and electron is <laughs> emitted, excited, and they excited. The excited the atom and they excited. So the electron can be effect of the primary emission and the excitation process. So here uh, you can see that photoelectric and electric cross sections are dominated for lower energy electrons, it's, for me, this is uh, low energy photons. For me, it's not very low uh, energy. Whereas in elastic uh, scattering, the Compton scattering uh, has uh, more higher cross section uh, if you use uh, uh, higher photon energy. So in principle, as I told you, all these processes depend uh, very much the intensity of your signal depends very much on the photon energy. And that is why it's nice to use tunable sources like synchrotrons in order to select, uh, to select your uh, photon energy. Uh, indeed, hard X-ray diffraction we can do and uh, also fluorescence and tassolo we can do with uh, laboratory sources, but it's not easy there to, to change the photon energy in a very easy tunable mode. So, as I told you, one of the most uh, important uh, for me uh, spectroscopy that we have thanks uh, to having tunable sources is uh, X-ray uh, absorption spectroscopy. So, since we have a tunable source, we can 
uh, change uh, the photon energy continuously. And uh, at the moment when uh, the photons get have an energy that uh, is uh, sufficient to excite and to eject electron to an empty state first, and then further on when we continue to increase uh, the energy, we will eject the electron <coughs> in the infinity. But the uh, absorption edge is exactly when uh, we reach the possibility to move an electron from a core level to an empty state in the valence band. And this is exactly a fingerprint, element-specific fingerprint. And this ejection can be from KLM uh, edges, depends on the photon energy <coughs> we are using. So, the intensity of uh, the spectrum that we get, since we have to move the electron from a, field, from a core to an empty state, depends on the number of empty states we have. So I, I compare here going from transition metals to noble metals, where the number of empty states are, is reducing. You can see that the signal, the spectroscopic absorption signal, Decreases. So, when we continue to increase uh, uh, the photon energy, then we start ejecting electrons, and uh, these uh, electrons are uh, hitting uh, actually the neighboring atom, and they affect the absorption coefficient, and you can see here that the edge is giving information for the valence state of the element, but afterwards you have these oscillations of the absorption coefficient, which are the fingerprints of the surrounding of the emitting atom. And these fingerprints are exactly illustrated because what is the chemical state, what are whether the oxygens are around, whether the same atoms are around and so on. And it gives a very precise uh, information for the chemical state uh, of the elemental for neighboring bonding. So with this, since uh, time is short, but uh, I uh, like very much uh, uh, this uh, uh, absorption spectra of carbon 1S, where you can see how different, how different are the absorption spectra depending on the bonding of carbon atom on the surround, uh, on the, uh, to other atoms that are surrounding. Because organics are very, very rich materials, you can see how different are the spectra depending what is the coordination of the emitting atom. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, the synchrotron light, especially using uh, special devices, uh, we can have all, uh, synchrotron light is naturally linearly polarized, but if we use a special undulator devices, we can provide also left and right circularly polarized light. <clears throat> and uh, since the magnetic uh, materials, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Forbidden, uh, not in the all uh, magnetic materials that uh, have a spin moment, uh, <clears throat> the transition, the electron transition are forbidden in dif if you uh, to different spin. And uh, that is why using left or right uh, <clears throat> polarized light we can have a different spectra and we can get exactly the information about the magnetic uh, moment, the sample. And as you see here uh, with red and blue, you can see the difference in the spectra you get 
using circularly polarized left or right. So you can very well see the difference in the number of uh, uh, empty states which spin up and spin down, and this gives uh, a very nice uh, uh, information for magnetic uh, state of your material. You'll hear a very nice lecture about uh, studies of microscopy by as I remember. So, uh, I like to very much to the students to remind them that Einstein didn't get the physics Nobel Prize for relativity, but for photoelectric effect. And photoelectric effect is exactly one of uh, the main events uh, uh, thanks to photon uh, matter interaction. And <clears throat> afterwards, there is a second Nobel Prize where the photoelectric effect exactly developing a spectroscopy on the basis of photoelectric effect, Kate, Kate Zimmer uh, uh, got a Nobel Prize because uh, he was the first one who built and showed the photoelectron spectroscopy or X-ray <coughs> or spectroscopy or electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. There are many names. Is one of very powerful technique to study the properties uh, of uh, matter, solid, gas, and liquid state. So, <clears throat> what is the photoelectron spectroscopy exactly? When uh, we hit uh, a sample with the photon for the certain energy. So we, here we work with the fixed photon energy, but since the cross section or uh, electron emission depends on the photon energy, we can select the photon energy for the element that there is of most interest of us. So we want to study particular element, all the chemical states and so on. We select the photon energy that is not far from the absorption edge and we have a higher signal and more information because uh, uh, as I tell you just in a moment, uh, depending on the environment of the emitting atom, you can get the information for its chemical state. So you see the typical XPS uh, spectrum, uh, emission from S, P, and also D states and so on and so on. And uh, uh, as a secondary, the excitation effect, we have also the emission of Fourier electrons. So this, Photoelectron spectrum contains the core level and uh, uh, Auger electron emission. And this spectrum shows what is the composition of your sample. What, is, uh, what are the elements in your sample? But the most important part of this uh, spectroscopy is uh, that for the same element, depending on its chemical state, we have so-called chemical shifts. So the electrons that are emitted are with different kinetic energy because you know quite well that when you have a chemical bond, the elemental, pure elemental core level changes its energy due to the <clears throat> chemical bond. And from these chemical shifts, we can see what is the uh, <clears throat> what is the chemical state. This is a very typical spectrum of silicon. So this is silicon dioxide, intermediate uh, silicon uh, oxides, and silicon, pure silicon. So you can see very well that uh, immediately you can uh, see the chemical uh, situation of your sample. Plus, since uh, the surface if you have a solid state, since the surface uh, uh, <clears throat> atoms have different environment from the bulk atoms of the element, uh, you can see the surface and uh, the bulk uh, uh, in emission from the surface atom and bulk atoms. And in principle, if you absorb some something onto the surface, immediately you can see changes in the surface core level. <clears throat> so when you do a spectroscopy, you should be quite uh, aware 
what is the depth of information you can uh, <coughs> have. You know quite well from electron spectroscopy uh, as well that uh, electrons uh, have a smaller bulb depth. And uh, since uh, uh, both photoelectron spectroscopy and X ray absorption spectroscopy can use electrons for uh, <coughs> detection of the spectra, probing depth using electrons does not exceed usually 10 nanometers. Here I would like to point out that since for absorption spectroscopy, we use a total electron yield that is dominated by the secondary electrons. Doing uh, absorption spectroscopy, collecting electrons, in any case, we have a little bit deeper uh, information for the sample composition than with the pure photoelectron spectroscopy, where actually the information depth uh, is usually no more than uh, few nanometers. Depends indeed on the photon energy, but if you go to harder X-rays, the problem is that the cross section is diminishing, so the signal is not very strong. So this I just want to indicate to you that since uh, <clears throat> when you have, uh, since uh, when you have uh, electron detection, you can do both absorption spectroscopy and photoelectron spectroscopy with the same instrument. And if you want to have a different depth information, so combine both techniques and uh, you have really a, a nice uh, result, much better than <clears throat> the results you can get with the laboratory ESCA machine. Plus, <clears throat> electron uh, <clears throat> If you have a, a topography of your sample, you, you can have shadowing of the electron emission or enhancement if your analyzer is at the grazing angle. So uh, especially when you do microscopy, photoelectron microscopy, then you can have also information for uh, the <coughs> topography of your sample. Surely, if you have photon detection, and again here I mentioned CAS, you see absorption spectroscopy is very nice uh, method because you can use both electron and photon signals for getting spectroscopy information. This is X-ray emission spectroscopy that is in principle fluorescence spectroscopy. I mentioned RICS because uh, resonant inelex with X-ray scattering is uh, very, very similar to some extent to, to Raman, but it is more broader. So you can see here that uh, uh, you have bulk information. In order to, to have bought bulk and surface information, using uh, photon detection, probably you should uh, use a very grazing angle reflectivity approach. <clears throat> In transmission, that is uh, one of the methods uh, uh, that is very commonly used in imaging is definitely what you have is uh, exclusively both information. So I wanted uh, Exactly, since I mentioned that uh, the advantages of using photons uh, is that you can have a much better spatial resolution, is due to the fact uh, that uh, in the last 30 years, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, development uh, in pushing uh, to microscopy techniques and uh, adapting uh, uh, the spectroscopy of uh, using uh, information from a very small spot, which means imagine that you use information from a very small spot, you can have enough photons and you can, should have a very nice detector. So in order to have microscopy, uh, the, main, the main approach is uh, <clears throat> using uh, photon optics that are focusing uh, your photon beam or demagnifying your photon beam. 
and the <coughs> lateral resolution is provided by this uh, photon optics. So you have a special uh, lecture for X-ray photoelectron emission microscopy where uh, you use a very modest uh, <coughs> focus beam. Again, you use uh, photon optics in order to uh, have a beam of few micron on the sample, but uh, <coughs> you use uh, <coughs> uh, electron optics like in electron microscopy in order to, to have uh, lateral resolution. So these are uh, just uh, for information of the students, I put this slide to show the different type of photon optical elements uh, that are uh, used uh, at the synchrotrons. So if they're interested, they can open Google and they can read more about that. The zone plate is uh, very, very common and now it is a very advanced optics and it's used uh, not only for focusing but for uh, other purposes uh, as well uh, <coughs> recently. What is the characteristic of this optic? That it is monochromatic. Unfortunately, using zone plate optics is uh, not that easy to do absorption spectroscopy because the focal distance changes with photon energy. So if you want to do absorption spectroscopy, it is a little bit complicated, but we have ways to work. You get images at different photon energies and out of these images, you can extract the absorption spectrum. So uh, this type of optics, normal incidence spherical mirror is, uh, as you see, uh, good only for low photon energy. And uh, we use it at the laser for doing angular result of the emission that uh, works best at low photon energy. The most common optic that is used in many beam lines uh, uh, just for uh, modest focusing uh, as well is uh, combination of two mirrors uh, and capillary and reflective lenses are used uh, exclusively for hard X-ray. So I just want to show you uh, with this uh, <coughs> slide that uh, using this type of microscopy, we can, uh, especially uh, <coughs> the full field imaging uh, microscopy, we can rotate the sample and we can have uh, 3D imaging, this is an example of 3D imaging of uh, a cell, and you can see very well the constituents of the cell in the 3D dimension. So, the most uh, uh, common are scanning X-ray microscopes, which means that you focus the beam, and as in a scanning electron microscope, you scan the sample with respect to the beam, and you select the signal of your interest. So here I show uh, the instrument that we have here at the letter, uh, where <coughs> scanning the sample with respect to the focus beam by the zone plates, we have fluorescence detectors around in order to collect the fluorescence signal and to have uh, uh, information for the constituents of our sample, and we can immediately collect the transmitted X-rays. So this is uh, imaging that you can do all type of uh, experiments. And this transmitted uh, signal gives you absorption spectroscopy, and uh, we recently use it for typography for type of coherent uh, imaging that uh, I'll mention about this a little bit later at the end of my presentation. So the other microscope is the one, so this microscope uses only photon detection. The other microscope is a scanning electron <coughs> microscope uh, that uh, uses a solitis photoelectron spectroscopy or RESCA from a small spot. So it is the same principle. And since it has a multi-channel detector, if we get the information, doctor information from all channels, we have a concentration map of our sample. So you see the bright spot part means that the element under investigation is a very high concentration. And uh, these uh, changes in the contrast uh, 
is indicating a concentration of the element of the investigation. But if we select channels, for example, if these are core level shifts due to the different chemical state of the element, we can select channels that are representative of different chemical states and we can have chemical information. Plus, afterwards, if we are very curious to see with uh, higher uh, actual resolution exactly what is the composition of uh, each of these spots, we can do normal uh, micro nanospot uh, spectroscopy. And uh, it can be done in spectral imaging by selecting from the from this image, and it can be done from the small spot. You see from the small spot, the pure spectroscopy is a little bit better energy result. So, <clears throat> some uh, <clears throat> summary. So the transmission electron microscopes are really revolving cathodes. So they have atomic resolution, still we cannot beat that. X-ray crystallography, is uh, not microscopic, although it uh, shows a 3D atomic structure. Classical X-ray microscopy that I showed you are still limited in resolution <clears throat> and the focal depth of optical elements and in temporal resolution. The scanning microscopes monitoring electrons, as I showed you, are limited to surfaces and the near surface region. So, what we can do in order to push the resolution and really to reach almost uh, atomic uh, uh, resolution with all uh, the information also for, for uh, the composition of the sample. So this can be measured with coherent beams. And as I mentioned to you, the diffraction limited the new or generation diffraction limited storage rings are pushing further in coherent light. The present synchrotrons also have third generation uh, some partial coherence, but uh, in order to do, uh, to use this coherence, we use the pin holes. But uh, the nice thing of this uh, uh, having coherent light that uh, we have a scattering pattern when the coherent photon beam hits the sample. And this scattering pattern actually encodes the distribution of the electron density of our sample. And we know that actually photons are scattered by the electron. And here comes the free electron laser radiation that is a highly coherent, almost fully coherent. Uh, sorry, sorry, this stupid telephone. <clears throat> fully coherent light. So I'll just illustrate you with a single, <clears throat> with a single shot, with a single pulse of free electron laser that we get this scattering pattern. But you see the sample disappear. Why? Because the photons that we have in this single <clears throat> free electron laser pulse are so many that we completely ionize and destroy the sample. But in any case, since these pulses are very short, they're shorter than the time required for sample destruction, we got this uh, scattering image. And with algorithms, we reconstruct our object. So using this coherent imaging, we can look at the uh, complex disordered particular matter and so on. Plus, since we have a very short process, we can look at the dynamic processes on the femtosecond uh, uh, on the femtosecond time scales. And here you can see if I hit my sample with a normal infrared laser and I change, for example, the magnetic structure of my sample with the second beam that is coming from the free electron laser. I encode exactly the changes in my sample. So I wanted just to show you that you should think in the future for free electron laser use as well. So summary, <clears throat> the methods we have is X-ray scattering, don't forget coherent diffraction imaging, which is also X-ray scattering, 
confusing, coherent light. So what we get here, structure, dress, train, texture, we can do two-dimensional and three-dimensional mapping, chemistry at resonances and dynamics with FEL. X-ray absorption spectroscopy, that is a great uh, spectroscopy that you can get short range structure, electronic, magnetic structure, chemical mapping. And as I mentioned to you, the depth information depends on the collected signal because it allows to collect electrons and photons. X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, that is a very old <laughs> technique because we started with it a long time ago in the laboratory, but the important thing is that this is surface sensitive. And for example, catalysis, one of the very important industrial processes depends exactly on the surface of the catalyst. X-ray fluorescence gives you bulk sensitivity plus quantification, you know, PPM, we can uh, measure concentration with uh, X-rays. And element mapping. This is a spectroscopy that uh, we have also in the laboratory. Infrared uh, spectrum microscopy that uh, has become possible thanks to the synchrotron, but now we use also uh, lasers, laboratory lasers. <laughs> Gives you uh, information, very important chemical information. And uh, the most uh, important thing is that this non destructive radiation. And X-ray microscopy depends what uh, you need. To. You can get morphology, density mapping, and high resolution. So with this summary, I think uh, I gave you some short overview of what you can do coming to the synchrotron, selecting the right uh, beam line with the right methodology. So uh, there is a very, very fast grow of uh, Synchrotron and FEL facilities all over the world. And I want to mention to you that uh, there is a leak of European accelerator based photon sources that was established three years ago and it unites uh, all the existing synchrotrons uh, in Europe uh, to push technology and uh, new methodology for characterization. But uh, in principle, I think that this is not only photons. We can use also all other type of uh, radiation and uh, uh, that uh, can give us complementary information for uh, uh, what is going on with our sample in static and dynamics. And uh, recently, there is also another consortium of analytical research infrastructures in Europe. And I think that uh, just collaborating between these different infrastructures, look here are the neutrons, it's a huge uh, <coughs> also consortium, we can uh, solve uh, human problems. Thanks a lot.